You know, for anyone really trying to get a handle on their gut health, there's often this this collection of symptoms that can be so confusing, like that bloating after eating that makes no sense, or maybe feeling tired all the time, or even that weird brain fog you just can't shake. These feelings, they're definitely signals, but figuring out the actual cause. Well, that's often the tricky part. Okay, let's unpack this a bit. Today, we're doing a deep dive into something that comes up a lot in these discussions, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, uh, SIBO. We've really dug into the research, the clinical perspective, some new ideas too. And honestly, it paints a really fascinating picture of how interconnected everything is. It really does. And our goal here, our mission for this dive, isn't just to define SIBO. We want to get into why it seems to be getting more attention now, uh, how the symptoms can actually spread way beyond the gut and look at the, you know, the careful ways it needs to be di diagnosed and managed. We're hoping to give you a really clear, solid overview, help you connect some dots you might already be noticing. Right. So before we get lost in the weeds of symptoms and fixes, let's just start with the basics. SIBO. What is it according to the sources we looked at? What's the core definition? Okay, yeah. Fundamentally, SIBO is defined as having an excessive number of bacteria, or sometimes an abnormal type of bacteria, living in the small intestine. Now, that sounds simple, but the key thing our research really highlights is this. Mm. It's usually not about inherently bad bacteria. It's more about bacteria being in the wrong place, huh. the small intestine, or just, well, too many of them there. Oh, uh, okay. See, normally, the small intestine should have relatively few bacteria compared to, say, the large intestine. Its main job is digesting food and absorbing nutrients. When SIBO happens, this overgrowth gets in the way of that. It interferes, leading to problems absorbing nutrients, malabsorption, and, yeah, a lot of those symptoms you mentioned earlier. So it's less about fighting invaders and more about, like, location, location, location in the gut. Mm. Maintaining the right neighborhood for the right microbes. Exactly. That's a great way to put it. It's about the gut's ecosystem, the balance, and where everyone's supposed to be living. That really shifts how you think about it, not just kill the bugs. Precisely. It's ecological. And something that really jumped out from the research was how much SIBO seems to happen when the body's own protective systems go a bit awry. What's the most common reason cited for this balance getting thrown off? Yeah, that's spot on. The most frequent underlying issue, the one that comes up again and again, is impaired motility. Specifically, problems with something called the migrating motor complex, the MMC. The MMC, that's the housekeeping way, right? That's the one. Think of it like the guts cleaning crew that runs between meals. It sweeps leftover food, debris, and bacteria down through the small intestine into the colon where they belong. If that cleaning wave isn't working properly, things stagnate. Bacteria can hang around and multiply in the small intestine, where they really shouldn't be in large numbers. Okay, so the cleaning crew gets lazy or disrupted. What kind of things did the research show can sideline this MMC? Are there common conditions linked to it? Oh, definitely. Several conditions are known culprits. For instance, diabetic enteropathy nerve damage from diabetes can mess with the gut muscles. Then there's scleroderma. You know, that autoimmune condition, it can stiffen tissues, including the gut wall, making movement really difficult. Wow, okay. Huh? And chronic inflammation, like you see in celiac disease or Crohn's disease, can damage the intestinal lining and nerves controlling it. Also, something less common called intestinal pseudo-obstruction, where it acts like a blockage, but it's actually a nerve or muscle problem. Mm -hmm. It all comes back to hindering that clearing wave. So it's not just sluggishness. It can be actual physical damage or nerve issues. Right. And beyond those functional motility problems, structural issues, actual physical things in the gut, mm -hmm. can also create problems. Think of it like um, little eddies or stagnant pools in a river. Surgical adhesions, scar tissue after surgery can create kinks. Strictures, which are narrowings of the intestine, can slow things down. Diverticula, those little out pouchings in the wall, they can become traps for bacteria. And things like fistulas or even certain surgeries that remove parts of the intestine can create what are called blind loops, net ends, where bacteria just thrive because there's no proper flow through. And it's not just about movement or blockages, is it? The research also pointed pretty strongly at the stomach itself being a first line of defense. Low stomach acid came up a lot. Absolutely critical. Stomach acid is like, well, it's the gatekeeper. It's meant to kill off a lot of the bacteria we swallow with our food and drink. Yeah. So if you have chronically low stomach acid, what's called hypochlorhydria, maybe from long-term use of acid-blocking meds like PPIs or H2 blockers. Which so many people take for reflux. Exactly. 
or from conditions like atrophic gastritis, then that defense is down. More bacteria survive the trip through the stomach and make it into the small intestine, setting the stage for overgrowth. Huh. So fixing one problem might sort of open the door for another one down the line, that interconnectivity again. It really is. And then you've got the other end of the small intestine to consider the ileocecal valve. The doorway to the large intestine. Precisely. It's supposed to be a one-way valve, keeping the huge bacterial population of the large intestine out of the small intestine. If that valve isn't working right, if it's incompetent, you can get backflow. Colonic bacteria migrating upstream into the small intestine where they don't belong direct cause of SIBO in some cases. And this isn't just happening in a vacuum, right? The research consistently linked SIBO with other conditions, too. Oh, absolutely. There's a really significant overlap noted with irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, so much so that some researchers think a lot of IBS might actually be SIBO. Interesting. Yeah, and it's also frequently seen with things like chronic pancreatitis, fibromyalgia, even skin conditions like rosacea, and various immunodeficiency disorders. It really drives home that the gut is talking to the rest of the body constantly. Okay, so pulling this together, with all these potential causes and connections, how does SIBO actually feel? What are people experiencing? The symptoms seem like they can be all over the map. They really can. But our sources usually point to a kind of classic trio of symptoms that are often the first clue. Number one is that abdominal bloating and distension. Mm. That feeling of being puffed up, often getting noticeably worse after eating, especially carbs, because the bacteria just love fermenting them. Right. The dreaded post-meal bloat. Exactly. Second is often diarrhea. This happens partly because the gas produced by fermentation, but also because the bacteria can mess with bile salts, which affects how you absorb fat. And third particularly if it's been going on a while or is quite severe, you can see malabsorption and weight loss because the body just isn't getting the nutrients it needs from food. Okay, those are the big three. But what other gut symptoms might show up? Yeah, lots of other common GI stuff. Things like ongoing abdominal pain or cramping. Sometimes it's vague, sometimes more localized. Uh, lots of gas and belching, you know, flatulence. Nausea is pretty common too. Right. And in cases where fat absorption is really hit hard, people might notice stitteria stools that are fatty, pale, really foul-smelling, and tend to float. That's a clear sign of fat malabsorption. Now, here's something that might seem counterintuitive. We usually think diarrhea, but the research highlighted that constipation can also be a major symptom, right? Specifically with a certain type. Yes, absolutely. That's a key point. Chronic constipation is strongly associated with methane-dominant SIBO. In fact, the terminology is shifting a bit now, and it's often called intestinal methanogen overgrowth, or yeah. IMO, to reflect that it's methane-producing archaea, not strictly bacteria, causing the issue and slowing things down. IMO, okay. So it can go either way too fast or too slow. Precisely. And this is where SIBO really shows its reach beyond the gut. Those systemic symptoms, they often stem from the chronic malabsorption and the low-grade inflammation it causes. So you see things like profound fatigue and weakness, the kind that sleep doesn't fix. You see specific nutritional deficiencies cropping up, iron deficiency, anemia, low B12, low vitamin D, AE. Which can cause their own set of problems. Absolutely. Neurological issues from B12 deficiency, bone problems from low D, skin issues. We also see joint pain. Sometimes seemingly random skin rashes, like that rosacea connection we mentioned. And then there's that really frustrating brain fog, difficulty concentrating, memory issues. It often floors people how much their gut health seems to be affecting their mental clarity. It's like a hidden driver for feeling unwell systemically. That gut-brain axis is just undeniable, isn't it? Feeling foggy because your digestion is off. Oh, wild. It really is. Okay, so given this huge range of symptoms, from gut stuff to brain fog to joint pain and the overlap with so many other conditions, how on earth do you actually figure out if SIBO is the culprit? Diagnosis sounds like a real challenge. It definitely can be, precisely because of that overlap. Uh, historically, the technical gold standard test was something called a jejunal aspirate and culture. Basically, during an endoscopy, they'd stick a tube down into the jejunum, the middle part of the small intestine, suck out some fluid, and then try to grow and count the bacteria in a lab. Sounds definitive, but I remember the notes mentioning it's not really done much anymore. Pretty invasive, right? And maybe not always accurate. Exactly. It's invasive. It's expensive. There's a risk of contamination during the procedure, which can skew the results. So, yeah, it's rarely used in standard clinical practice these days. So what is the standard approach then, the non-invasive one? The workhorse is breath testing. It's much more practical. The idea is pretty neat. You drink a sugar solution, usually 
lactulose, or glucose. If you have excessive bacteria in your small intestine, they'll ferment that sugar way earlier than they should. That fermentation produces gases, specifically hydrogen and corridor methane. These gases get absorbed into your bloodstream, travel to your lungs, and you breathe them out. So we collect breath samples over, say, two or three hours and measure the levels of these gases. A significant rise early on suggests SIBO. And the type of gas is important, like we touched on, hydrogen versus methane. Yes, very important. Generally, high hydrogen H production is linked more often with diarrhea-predominant symptoms, whereas high methane CH production is strongly associated with constipation and that IMO picture we discussed. So the test can give clues about the type of overgrowth. Okay, that makes sense. But their research also mentioned some debate about how reliable these breath tests are, especially maybe the lactulose one. What's the general feeling on that now? That's a fair point, and it's true. There is ongoing discussion. Glucose is thought to be more specific for SIBO in the upper part of the small intestine because it gets absorbed quickly. It's less likely to reach the colon and cause a false positive from colonic bacteria fermenting it. Lactulose, on the other hand, isn't absorbed, so it travels the whole length of the small intestine. This means it can detect overgrowth further down, but yes, if someone has fast transit, it might reach the colon within the testing window, potentially giving a false positive. So a bit of interpretation needed. Definitely. Neither test is perfect, but there are best non-invasive tools right now. The key is interpreting the results alongside the person's specific symptoms and history. They provide strong indications. Got it. And are there other tests that help build the picture? Yeah, often other tests are used in a supportive role. Blood tests are really useful for checking those nutritional deficiencies, B12, iron, ferritin, fat-soluble vitamins, checking for anemia. Stool tests can help rule out other things like infections, parasites, or assess markers of digestion and inflammation. And occasionally, imaging like a CT scan or MRI might be ordered if there's suspicion of an underlying structural issue, like a stricture or adhesions. Okay, so let's say the tests point towards SIBO. Diagnosis is made. What happens next? What's the plan for getting relief? The sources seemed clear it's not just one thing, it's a multi-step approach. That's exactly right. It's multifaceted. The main goals are usually threefold. One, reduce the bacterial overgrowth itself. Two, address whatever underlying issue allowed it to happen in the first place. And three, correct any nutritional deficiencies. So step one, tackling the overgrowth. How is that usually done? The primary tool is often antibiotic therapy. The most commonly prescribed one is rifaximin, brand name Zefaxin. A big advantage of rifaximin is that it's minimally absorbed into the bloodstream. It stays mostly in the gut, targeting the bacteria there with fewer systemic side effects. It works particularly well for hydrogen-dominant SIBO. Okay. And what about for the methane type, the IMO? For methane, it's often tougher. Methane producers aren't as susceptible to rifaximin alone. So you often see combination therapy rifaximin plus another antibiotic, commonly neomycin or sometimes metronidazole, to effectively tackle the methanogens. Makes sense. Now, antibiotics are key, but what about diet? The research seemed to position diet as supportive, but maybe not the cure on its own. Yes, that's a really important distinction. Diet plays a crucial supportive role, but it typically doesn't eradicate SIBO by itself. There's the elemental diet. This is pretty intense. It's a liquid formula of pre-digested nutrients. You drink only this, usually for two or three weeks. The idea is the nutrients get absorbed so quickly high up that there's nothing left for the bacteria further down to eat, effectively starving them out. It can be very effective, but wow, it's a tough regimen to stick to. I can imagine. What about less extreme dietary approaches, things like low FODM? Right. The other main strategy involves low fermentation diets. Mm. The most well-known is the low FODM AF diet, but there are others like the SIBO-specific diet or the biphasic diet. FODMPs are specific types of short-chain carbs, fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols that gut bacteria love to ferment. By temporarily reducing these high FODMA foods, you reduce the food available for the overgrown bacteria, which can significantly lessen symptoms like gas and bloating. Temporarily being the key word there. Absolutely critical. These diets are meant to be used alongside treatment for symptom management and to help the treatment work better. They are not intended as permanent long-term diets because they can be overly restrictive and potentially harm the beneficial bacteria in the long run. You usually reintroduce foods later. Okay, good clarification. So antibiotics reduce the load. Diet helps manage symptoms. What about preventing it from coming back? That cleaning wave, the MMC, seems key. Exactly. Preventing recurrence is huge, and that often involves using prokinetics. 
These are medications or sometimes supplements that help stimulate the migrating motor complex, that gut cleaning wave, to keep things moving through the small intestine properly between meals. Like giving the cleaning crew a nudge. Precisely. Examples might include low-dose erythromycin, used for its motility effect, not antibiotic effect here, prucalopride, or even natural options like ginger or sometimes 5-HTP are used. The goal is to keep the small intestine swept clean to stop bacteria from settling back in. And tying it all together, it sounds like none of this works long term if you don't figure out why the SIBO happened. Addressing the root cause seems paramount based on everything we read. Couldn't agree more. It's absolutely yeah. crucial. If the underlying reason isn't addressed, SIBO is highly likely to relapse. So that might mean working with your doctor to carefully get off PPIs if they're not truly needed. It might mean strict gluten-free diet adherence for celiac disease, managing diabetes better, or in cases of structural issues, maybe even surgery to fix adhesions or a blind loop. You have to fix the underlying vulnerability. All right. And lastly, but definitely not least, is nutritional support. If malabsorption has led to deficiencies, actively correcting those is vital. That could mean B12 shots, high-dose vitamin D, iron infusions, whatever is needed to restore nutrient levels and support overall healing. It's a really comprehensive picture. So flipping the coin, what are the risks if SIBO just isn't addressed? If someone just lives with these symptoms long term, what can happen? Yeah, the potential long-term consequences can be quite serious. Untreated, severe SIBO can lead to significant malabsorption, potentially causing major weight loss, muscle wasting a state called cachexia. The specific nutritional deficiencies can become really problematic. Mm -hmm. B12 deficiency, as we mentioned, can cause permanent neurological damage if not corrected, plus severe anemia. Lack of fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, K, can contribute to things like osteoporosis from low vitamin D, night blindness from low A, and even problems with blood clotting due to low vitamin K, which increases bleeding risk. Wow. And beyond the nutrients, the research mentioned effects on the gut lining itself. Yes. The chronic inflammation caused by the bacterial overgrowth and their byproducts can damage the delicate lining of the small intestine. This can lead to increased intestinal permeability, what people often call linky gut. This leaky barrier can allow a bacterial components or undigested food particles to enter the bloodstream, potentially triggering immune reactions. This might contribute to the development of new food intolerances or sensitivities, widespread systemic inflammation affecting other parts of the body, and generally just a really poor quality of life because of the constant draining symptoms. It's not just an upset stomach, it can become a systemic burden. It really paints a picture of how a localized gut issue can ripple outwards and affect everything. What an exploration. We've covered so much ground from defining SIBO as bacteria in the wrong place to untangling its complex roots in things like poor motility or low stomach acid, mapping out that wide symptom spectrum from bloating to brain fog, digging into the tricky diagnosis process and outlining that really integrated treatment plan. It's definitely clear SIBO is, well, it's common, often flies under the radar, but has these really significant far-reaching impacts. Absolutely. And hopefully having this deeper understanding is empowering. It helps you make connections, maybe understand signals your own body is sending a bit better, and perhaps feel more equipped to discuss these things with your doctor. Definitely. So here's something to chew on as we wrap up. What if that fatigue you can't explain, or that skin issue that popped up, or even those achy joints? What if they have a deeper connection back to what's happening in your digestive system, specifically your small intestine, than you ever thought possible? It's worth considering. And of course, we have to add the important disclaimer. Everything we've discussed today is for educational purposes. SIBO is a genuine medical condition. It's really essential to work with a qualified healthcare professional, a gastroenterologist, a knowledgeable primary care doc, maybe a registered dietitian specializing in gut health for an accurate diagnosis and a treatment plan that's right for you. Please don't self-treat based on this conversation. Sound advice. Thanks for diving deep with us today.